stats back on the final, probably, but not on this. Um, and that's it. If not, maybe a single command or something like that, kind of like on the first exam. <coughs> all right, so we all, we're all comfortable with that to the extent that you're going to get comfortable with it? All right, so um, this is not on the test. I'm a little bit behind, which is unusual because usually we're ahead. But um, So this will be the beginning of the third part of the course. So you know, first part was statistics, um, second part was linear and nonlinear algebraic systems, and third part is differential equation systems, okay? So first thing we want to cover and talk about is how we get a differential equation to begin with. Okay. And um, this is real chemical engineering. Now it's a little bit challenging because you guys um, haven't had a lot of the courses that I'm used to you taking for me to present this material. So I kind of split it up <coughs> into, um, uh, well, there's an introduction part. There's a second part, which is systems I know you're going to be comfortable with because they involve nothing but mass and energy balances, and I know you've had that. And at the end, I have to stretch it out a little bit to get some things that are a little more interesting. And, um, so that may be a little bit new, but I'm hoping it'll be okay. It's, it's, not, it's not too complex, okay? So. I'll get through as much of this as I can, and we'll have to come back and do it on Tuesday to finish, probably. I've always wanted to use the word ubiquitous. You don't get to use the word ubiquitous every day, so I threw it in this first sentence. Um, so these models are, you know, ordinary differential equation models, I'd say the most common type of model you see in chemical engineering. <coughs> and when you guys take, um, let's say, heat and energy balances, and you do write an energy balance, that's a model. Like, okay, we know energy is conserved, but you don't actually know enough about the system for you to say that's the true description of the system, but it's your model of what you think is happening, okay? So you've already been doing modeling when you took mass and energy balances. And you know, when you do thermo and you come up with an equation of state, that's a model of the gas phase behavior or what have you, okay? Um, so the way we're going to get these ODE models, we're going to apply basic conservation principles, which are, you know, for our purposes, mass, energy, and momentum. In this class, we won't do anything with momentum because that's usually done in the transport courses or fluids, but um, we will do mass and energy. So if we're going to write out a differential equation, hopefully you guys appreciate at this point there's some independent variable, like it's either time or some spatial coordinate of some domain that you're trying to m model, okay? And so depending on the type of problem, that independent variable will change, and we'll talk about that. I hope you've learned that when you solve a differential equation model, you need a, something like a boundary or initial condition, right? You've been doing that, and I hope, I pray. Um, so if you have a problem you're trying to solve, you need some kind of boundary or initial condition to solve the equation. So if the independent variable is time, okay, then we call, the, we call the model a dynamic model or an unsteady state model or something like that. And then invariably, you get an initial condition, you know? You, you say what something is at time equals zero, and you want to evolve the system forward in time. Um, if it's a spatial domain, then it's at some point in the domain, like the entrance of a reactor, the exit of a reactor, something like this. We'll talk about all these things. <coughs> if the model's linear, so a linear, well, I know you've seen this. A is a constant, right? Please tell me you know, you know how to solve that, <laughs> that differential equation. Or so what you do is you'd separate and integrate that, and the solution would be exponential. And you know, to, to solve this problem, I would need to give you a value of y at some point x, right? This would be a boundary condition. Or if it's at x equals 0 or time equals 0, these are called initial condition. But OK. Um, so if the equation is linear like this, or even if it's a set of linear differential equations, it doesn't have to be just one, then we're going to be able to solve it analytically, and I'll show you how to do that in about a week. Um, but if the equation is nonlinear, um, then we're going to be able to ha we need to solve it numerically. It's like the same difference between <coughs> if I give you a system of equations that looks like this, you know, we can solve that analytically, right? You have to find the inverse of A, but you can do Gauss journal elimination and things like that. If I give you a system of equations like this where f is some nonlinear and arbitrary nonlinear function, then you can't solve that analytically. You've got to do some iterative Newton method or something like that. So it'll be the same thing with differential equations. All right. 
So we're starting with something pretty simple. This is my this is my attempt at graphic art. I hope you like the water is nice and blue. It should be relaxing to you. Um, we are doing the following. We're flowing liquid into a tank. Okay. The flow rate there, W i, is going to be a mass flow rate. People usually use the term W for mass flow rate and Q for volumetric flow rate. If you haven't seen that before, so that m might have units of like if you like SI units, be something like kilograms per hour or something like that. Um, we're going to have a flow out of the tank called W0 for outlet, okay? And you see on the outlet of that tank is a valve. <coughs> so we can control the outlet flow perhaps using that valve, for example. In the tank is a volume of fluid. This is liquid. Um, the, it's, uh, the volume is A times H. A is the cross-sectional area. We assume it's cylindrical tank, and A is the, the, the level or the height of the liquid, okay? Usually we'd like to know what the level is, for example. And uh, for a problem like this, obviously it's very simple. We'll have a certain set of assumptions we might want to use. Um, I don't list them all, but so one would be that um, the density of the fluid is constant, so it doesn't change. Um, the cross-sectional area of the tank, that's pretty reasonable, um, doesn't change, so it's a cylindrical tank. Um, and we might want to assume that this system operates under steady state conditions, okay? So let's see if you understand what steady state is. So what would steady state here mean? This is, this is the old attempt to engage the class in conversation. Let's see how it goes. All right, yeah. Right. So what was said if you didn't hear, a steady state for this problem would mean the flow wi is equal to flow w out w o, which we'll prove in a second. Um, and we might also have a situation where the flow out w0 is a known function of the level. And you'll see this, I guess, probably when you take um, uh, a transport course, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do is, is write out um, a model for this system. And I'm gonna do it very slowly so we're all on the same page. So here's my experience for you guys, is you haven't done this a lot, but when you do do it, you assume everything's at steady state. So when you took mass and energy balances, I bet almost all the time you assumed this is at steady state. So right, the general balance equation is accumulation equals N minus out plus generation. And usually the first step, you probably threw away the accumulation term, set it equal to zero, which means you're at steady state. But in this case, if we do that, the problem is really boring, so we're not going to do that. So here's what we have. So first of all, just not worry about the accumulation term. Certainly the N minus out terms make sense, right? There's a mass balance. And so WI is the flow in, it has units of mass per unit time, and W zero is the flow out. So again, that's mass per unit time. So it's a mass flow rate. So right, when you do a balance like this, you want things, if you're balancing mass, you want everything in the equation to be mass per time. If you're balancing energy, it'd be energy per time, okay? So those are, those are the mass flow rates in and out of the system, okay? If those mass flow rates are equal, as was said, then you'll be at steady state. But if those flow rates are not the same, then the level is gonna go up or down, right? That makes sense to you? So if you have more flowing, going into the tank than coming out, the level's gonna increase. So that's where this accumulation term comes in. So the way you write the accumulation term is, because this model, the independent variable's time, we're worried about non-steady state behavior, you wanna write derivative, okay, with respect to time, and then you wanna put what is the quantity that's accumulating, in other words, mass. If this this has units of mass in here, this will have units of mass per time, right? Because the derivative is with respect to time, okay? So what you want to do is write what is the mass of fluid in that tank, okay? And so this is, I hope you agree, this is the volume of fluid in the tank. This cross-sectional area is A, its level is H. And that's volume, which is not mass. And if you multiply that times the density of the fluid rho, then that's mass. You take the derivative, that's mass per time, okay? And that's what, that's what I've written on the board. So generically, um, my experience teaching classes like this for a long time is that no one has any problem with the terms on the right-hand side usually, or at least for now, but people maybe don't fully understand the accumulation part, okay? All right, so you get that equation there, which I've written and I've showed you underneath what they correspond to. Um, if you look at the assumptions I made, I assume rho was, a con rho was a constant, the density of the fluid, and A was a constant. So if something's a constant, you can pull it out of the derivative, right? And that's all I've done here, pull that thing out of the derivative. 
And now I have a diff that's a differential equation, right, for the level. So to solve that equation up there means to come up with a solution that looks like how h depends on time. That's what we mean by solving it. We're not talking about solving it now. We're just talking about formulating it. But if you want to solve it, that's what we're talking about. Okay. So to solve this equation, obviously I'd have to give you w i and w zero, and I have to give you rho and a, right? And then I would need to also give you this, something like this. What is the level at time zero, let's say? Right? You can't tell me where the level is going if you don't know where it starts. So I'd give you what the level is at time equals zero, and then you solve the equation to get h as a function of time. We're not trying to solve right now. Right? Okay. All right, if the system was a steady state, then you could set that derivative equal to zero. Um, I have the nomenclature that if you're talking about steady state, all the variables get a bar on top of them. because Potentially, in that first equation, the wi and wo might depend on time. Okay, but I don't want to write everything depending on time because it's too cumbersome. So if things don't depend on time, I'll put a bar over them. Okay, it's a, we don't put a bar over rho because we know density doesn't depend on time. Okay, so we don't bother with things or cross-sectional area. But for these flow rates, could depending on time. I'm in the second equation. I'm telling you this does not depend on time. Right, because we set the accumulation term equals zero, and then we get back what was said. Um, the two flows are going to equal each other at steady state. Okay? All right, so fine. Um, what if <coughs> the outlet flow, if you look at this picture here, sorry to go back, you can imagine that, I don't know if you've learned this somewhere in, your cl in some class, but it's very likely because you have a resistance here to flow, that the flow out of this tank depends on the level in the tank. Right? So that's the, the, right, the driving force for flow is the pressure head in this tank. Have you heard that term, head, before? Okay. So that's the you know, um, amount of liquid. And so the higher this level gets, the more flow will go out of the tank because there's more pressure pushing down the half flow. Okay. So a typical way to model that is one of these two expressions here. So you can either assume the flow out of the tank is a linear function of the level, okay, and the proportionality constant here, something called the valve coefficient. So this would be some characteristic of the valve that's on the outlet stream. Okay. Or you could assume that it's proportional to the square root of the level. You might say, why would you do that? Because that comes from something called the Bernoulli equation. Have you guys probably haven't done, have you done the Bernoulli equation somewhere? Maybe? Okay. All right. So, you know, we could, we could say this, or this is probably a little more realistic from the physics of the problem, but I do both for the cases that you'll see. So if I take this expression for W0 and plug it in right there, then I'll get this differential equation there, okay? And of course, like I said, to solve this differential equation, I'll have to give you an initial condition. If you look at this differential equation here, it's linear, okay? Why is it linear? Well, because the, the dependent variable here is H, right? And H only appears in a linear fashion. So, the so for a differential equation model to be linear, the derivatives have to appear in a linear fashion, and the variable itself has to appear in a linear fashion. So, for example, if this was h squared over here, that would not be linear. Okay. So this the derivative, this is linear in the derivative of h. This doesn't even involve h, and that's linear in h itself. That makes the differential equation linear. It's a key um, consideration because you can solve these type of things analytically. Okay. The on the other hand, if the outlet flow here was equal to the square root of the level, so it just looks like this equation, except now the outlet term involves the square root, this differential equation is nonlinear because the, this is a nonlinear, that's not a linear term. Square root, you know, power of something, exponential log, those are all nonlinear functions. So that's a nonlinear differential equation, and that's going to be a different beast to, um, to solve, okay? Now, in principle, both these problems can be solved by separating and integrating. You might not see how that's done because you've got, you've got this WI floating around, but you can get rid of the WI. I'll teach you how to do that later. And you might be able to separate and integrate. I think you can solve both these by separation and integration, right? So what kind of techniques have you learned to solve differential equations? All the usual, separate and integrate, integrating factors, um, trying to think exact differential equations. Did you do that? Okay. So you're learning all the usual suspects. <laughs> Okay, so those are great to learn because if you don't learn how to solve a differential equation, you don't even know what a solution of different differential equation means. But it's going to be commonplace that for the problems that we talk about, those methods aren't going to work. <laughs> and they're not going to work for 
one of two reasons. One is that the, linear, the differential equations are linear, but we don't have one of them. We have more than one. So I'm assuming when you guys did second order differential equations, you did a single differential equation that had a second order derivative, right? Like, you know, something like this. So this is a second order linear homogeneous differential equation. So you learned how to solve that. You've, you've probably found some roots of this, something called the characteristic polynomial of this thing. Okay. Those are actually the eigenvalues. We'll talk about that. Um, so, okay. So this is nice, right? So you've learned how to solve many differential equations that are probably first or second order that are linear. But if you have systems that are either nonlinear or they involve more than one equation, then we're going to have to find new ways to solve them, and I'll teach you how to do that. Okay. It ends up that an equation that looks like this, which is second order, we can always write as two first order differential equations. So in this class, we're only going to consider first order differential equations. We're never going to consider second order. Because I'm going to teach you this. I can always write this equation as two first order differential equations. So we're going to talk about systems of first order differential equations. Okay. All right. So if I, if I didn't think that was stimulating enough, I could, go <laughs> I could put two tanks in series, all right? So don't even ask me why we would do this. Now, I have to tell you these, you, you might think storage tanks, so that's, that's a stupid example. But if you go into a real chemical plant, you'll, you, you guys know, you've heard the term unit operation, I hope, maybe. This would be a thing like A reactor, A heat exchanger, A distillation column, whatever. Um, invariably, in a big plant, between every two big unit operations, there exists a tank like this that holds inventory. Okay, so that way, you know, if one piece of equipment is producing too much, you can temporarily store it in this tank. Or if it's producing too little, you can draw from the tank. So it just provides much, makes the plant much more operable, easier to operate. So if you go into plants, you'll see these storage tanks all the time. Uh, you won't usually see two in series. You'd be surprised. You might you <coughs> might go into a plant and you'll find two of these in series and you'll ask, why don't they just have one? And they'll say, because we had two smaller ones already available. You're like, oh, that's high tech. Okay. Um, so what we're doing here is putting a flow into the first tank. Again, mass flow rate WI. We're going to have some volume and therefore some liquid level H1 in the first tank. That's going to flow out. It's going to be a flow W1, we're going to call it. This is the flow out of the um, first tank and that's going to be the inlet to the second tank. Second tank is going to have some volume V2 and therefore level H2, and there's going to be some flow out called W2. Okay? All right. So at this point, um, we can write out the balance equations for this. And they look just like before, right? So all we're going to do now is just do the same thing we did before twice. So it shouldn't be too hard to understand if you understood the first example. Okay, so we, we're going to write a mass balance on this tank. So what is the accumulation term? It's the accumulation, in other words, DDT, of whatever the mass of fluid in the first tank is. Well, the, the volume of the fluid is that. If you multiply that times rho, then that's the mass of fluid in the first tank. You set that equal to what flows in minus what flows out. Okay, and then again, we'll say what flows out of the tank is a function of the level of the tank, and we'll assume it's linear like that. So that looks just like the equation on the previous page. Just that bunch of ones now, because I have the first tank. <coughs> and now we can take this if we wanted to, and we can solve this thing for the derivative, right? So I can pull rho and I can pull rho a1 out of here, and then I can divide by it and get this equation. Typically, when we write differential equation models, we like to write them where on the left hand side is nothing but the derivative, and then the right hand side is everything else, right? So. The reason I divide rho and a1 across both sides of the equation is because I want only the derivative on the left-hand side, because that's the way we normally write them, as you'll see. Okay, so that's first tank. Second tank's more of the same, for the most part. Um, so you write out your accumulation term, right? It looks just the same, but now you're doing it on the second tank. The flow into the second tank is called w1. It's the flow out of the first tank. The flow out of the second tank is called w2. Okay. And now both of these depend on levels, right? The W1 is the flow out of the first tank, and it depends on the level of the first tank like that. W2 is flow out of the second tank. It depends on the level of the second tank like that. Okay. Pull the row A2 out and divide, and you get 
at this, this equation here. And again, to solve a differential equation like this, I'll need to tell you what the level was to begin with. So if you take the two equations I wrote and just put them together, the one on the previous page, which I won't bother showing you because it's right there, and then the one I just derived, which is that one, okay? This is what we call linear differential equation system, okay? So first of all, why is it linear? Because you can see the dependent variables here are H1 and H2, and they only appear in a linear fashion. And I have a typo. <laughs> I wish I could point. I wish I could jump. Would you be, you'd be duly impressed if I jumped up and touched the screen, right? Okay, that ain't happening, so let me come over here. So there should be an H2, I'll fix it. H2 right there, and there should be another H2 right there. So sorry about that. I dropped the H2 that appeared right there. Mistake. All right, um, so if you look at this equa set of equations, you, you first thing you say, it, it's linear, why? Because H1 and H2, the two dependent variables appear in a linear fashion, that makes it linear. It's an ordinary, okay? Why do we call it ordinary differential equations? Well, there's two kinds of differential equations, ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations. Have you heard the word partial differential equation? Yeah? So that would be an equation where you had two independent variables like time and space or two spatial coordinates. There, it's a whole new ball game than what we do here. So it's beyond the scope, it's an upper level of complexity. So we only talk about ordinary, which means one independent variable. Differential equation, that goes without saying. System, why do we call it system? Because there's two equations. Okay. So it's not just one equation, it's two. So my guess is you guys don't know how to solve this set of equations, right? And my guess is that you can't solve it for two reasons. Or I shouldn't say you can, but I guess you could solve one equation, right? Because this equation is not homogeneous. Do you agree with this? If you were to take this equation and write it in the form I bet you're used to writing it in, it would look like rho A1 dH1 dT equals, what is it, W I? Minus C V1 H1, I think. Is that, that's what it would look like? Okay. Um, and so, my guess is you would normally write it like this. So I, I apologize. I bet you can solve that one. Right? It's a linear, first order differential, non homogeneous equation. I bet you can solve that if you want. Even if I made this wi some function of time, you guys do that? Um, but what's new here, almost certainly, is the fact now we've got two equations, right? So in principle, you know, you could solve this equation, get the answer, and plug that answer in this equation. Now you got another non-homogeneous equation for, w, for uh, H2. But in general, um, what we want to be able to do is solve a set of equations that look, look like this. We don't want to solve them one at a time. We want to solve them all at the same time. Okay? And I'll teach you how to do that. So I should have also said these two equations are coupled together, right? Because H2 depends on H1. Now H1 doesn't directly depend on H2, right? Because there's no H2 over here. Which it makes physical sense, right? Because the flow goes out of the first tank and the second tank. There's no reason the first tank would depend on the second. Well, certainly the second depends on the first. All right, so that's a linear ODE system and that's gonna be one of our main focuses of, of the class, of this part of the class. All right, here's another example. And, the, and uh, I have to admit, one, one disadvantage of the textbook is it's not a chemical engineering textbook. You probably have noticed that. So when they have examples in the textbook, they're all kinds of weird stuff. Electrical circuits and pumps and God knows what. Okay. So um, these kind of examples that, especially the chemical engineering oriented examples that I show you are ones I've created. They're not going to tend to be in the textbook. The textbook is great at presenting the methods, I think, and the underlying theory behind it, but applications tend to be very diverse, so. All right, so here's another example, which is not in the textbook. So what we're doing here is we're taking a fluid into a tank, and we're taking this fluid, so it's got some inlet temperature Ti, it's got some inlet flow rate Wi, we're putting into this tank, this thing here, if you haven't seen this before, this is a mixer, okay? We're assuming this tank is well mixed which I'll explain the implications of that in a minute. 
This tank has a volume of fluid V here, okay? And we're gonna add heat to this tank because we wanna heat the fluid up. We wanna take the fluid from some inlet temperature Ti to some outlet temperature, which we call T, okay? So the goal of the system is simply to heat the fluid, transfer heat from here into the fluid, and then we'll take this hot fluid and do something with it. Use it as a heat exchange medium or something like this. Okay. So inlet temperature is Ti, inlet flow, mass flow, Wi, those are the outlet conditions here. Okay. Q is the amount of heat. I know you guys haven't had, um, well, you've had energy balances, so I guess this should be pretty comfortable. Okay, so implicit in all the things we write for systems that look like this is they're well mixed. That is critical because if the system is not well mixed, then the temperature here might be different than the temperature here than the temperature there, okay? And if that's the case, then you need something called computational fluid dynamics. It's like several orders of magnitude <laughs> more difficult than what we do, okay? So at this level, we always assume things are well mixed. And obviously, if you have a big mixer and a small amount of fluid, you can mix it pretty well. In industry, things are often not well mixed because you have a huge tank and the mixer is not huge. So maybe in industry, the kind of models we write out would not be that accurate because this is, we assume it's well mixed and it's not, but for the things we do, that'll be fine. All right, so here's the assumptions we're gonna make to write out. So when you first start, you know, this is the process of writing differential equation models. Um, since I do this all the time, I don't list the assumptions usually but it's often a good idea to list what assumptions you're making to write out the equations. So I'm going to make the assumption, first of all, that the volume is constant, okay? So how could the volume be constant here? Well, you kind of see it in the diagram. If you had, if you had an overflow line, so you know you have a tank and then the flow out is whatever flows over the top, then you'll get constant volume. The volume will always be here because it won't flow out until it goes over this thing and then they go out this overflow line. So you can get a constant volume if you want. So you might say, how do I know that it's constant volume? The, the answer is if I gave you a problem, I would tell you that. Like you're not, there's no way for you to know on a piece of paper if it's true. So if I wanted you to assume it, I would tell you it's, it's to be assumed. Perfect mixing, that's always assumed. I just told you why, otherwise we can't do anything. All right, so you've got, your he you're transferring heat from this coil here, or this heating device. Does it work now? Check, check. No, it doesn't. It's all a big lie. It's, uh, it's picking up on your sound. <laughs> There's no discernible sound. Oh, sorry. There's discernible sound, thanks. All right. There's one question. It's like, how did he know it wasn't working? Where did he come from? You went and got him? No, I just Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I know him well. I'm just wondering how he, he knew something had gone awry. All right. So constant volume, I'm telling you this. Perfect mixing, we always assume. We're always going to probably assume this one as well. So you're transferring heat to a fluid, right? The fluid's probably hotter than the ambient. You understand? The out here is air. And so it's possible that this tank might lose heat to the surroundings. But we're going to assume it's insulated, so there's no heat loss. Okay? And we'll almost always, unless I explicitly tell you otherwise, to assume that constant physical properties. Because you understand density and heat capacity, you've done density, I know, right? And you've, done, you've learned about heat capacity. These things depend on temperature, right? So I'm telling you that these things are a weak enough function of temperature that even though the temperature of this tank is gonna, may vary, um, I don't want you to worry about the variations in the density because they're small, so we're going to neglect them, okay? And part of the art of modeling, not a system this simple, but maybe as it gets more complex, is trying to figure out what assumptions like this make sense or not. Because if you make an assumption that, that's a little bit accurate but makes it much easier to work with, that's reasonable, you know. But, you know, what would be a, probably a stupid assumption is this system is isothermal. <laughs> that's the whole point is to predict the temperature, so <laughs> probably not a good assumption there. So the only, the only real assumption that's, that I would have to tell you is that it's constant volume. These other ones we would always make. They're kind of standing assumptions. Okay. All right. So we need to write out an energy balance for this. But so the idea is that the, when you're going to write out a model, the first thing you want to do is look at the system and figure out what balances do you need. Okay. So for example, I'm going to go back. 
if I look at this system and I say, do I need a mass balance? I'm like, I'm storing fluid in a tank, probably. Okay. Do I need a component balance? I don't see any components here. There's no mixing. There's no reaction. No. Do I need energy balance? No one's talking about temperature. So no one's talking about heat. So I don't think I need an energy balance. Okay. So that's why I just do a mass balance on this. If I look at this one, I ask, do I need a mass balance? You always need a mass balance. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Do I need a component balance? There's no components. Do I need an energy balance? Looks like it, right? Because I'm putting in heat. I'm, I'm saying the temperature going in is different than temperature coming out. So yeah. So let's write a mass balance and let's write an energy balance. So there's the mass balance. So the, we're going to have first the accumulation term. So we're going to take the derivative of the volume of the fluid in the tank. The volume of the fluid in the tank is rho times v, right? Rho times v is mass. Take the derivative, that's mass per time. Rho's constant, volume's constant. Therefore, that derivative is 0. Okay, that's why I wrote it 0. And that, has, that accumulation term, which in this case happens to be 0, has to equal the difference between the fl mass flow in and the mass flow out. So all that mass balance tells you is the flow in and the flow out are equal to each other. Okay? But if I were to give you this problem on an exam, it would be a good idea to write this. Okay? You understand? Because sometimes in the exams, as you'll see, probably on the final exam, is that sometimes I'll ask you to derive a model that looks like the one, and then I'll have you do a bunch of stuff with it. But I'll have to give you the equation, because otherwise you'll get zero. You see? Like if you can't derive the model, you can't do parts B, C, D, or E. Then get zero. <laughs> That's not good. So oftentimes I'll give you the equation, and I, I'll tell you to derive it. So um, even though this may or may not be obvious to you that this is true, it's obvious to me. Um, it's a good thing to write it out and show it. Okay. All right. So now you have to do an energy balance. I should probably say enthalpy balance. You guys, do you guys do enthalpy yet? All right. I always tell my wife the two things I hate in life are, are gravity and entropy. Okay. She's like, you're really weird. Okay. But I hate gravity because I'm always dropping stuff on the floor. Okay, and having to pick it up. And I hate, I hate uh, entropy because every time I'm trying to pack like a bunch of cords into a small space, entropy tries to impede my progress. Okay, but enthalpy is pretty cool. I have no problem with it, and it looks a little something like this. So let's let's neglect the accumulation term there, because maybe it's a little bit confusing. So, do you, do you guys know that enthalpy is a state function? Okay. So what I've done here is I've written out. Um, the enthalpy of the inlet stream, okay? You've heard of MCP delta T, right? It looks something like that. So this is the temperature, and to calculate the enthalpy of a stream that temperature T i have to do that relative to some reference temperature, right? That's what, that's what you mean by it being a state function. And so T ref is whatever reference temperature I choose. It doesn't matter what it is. It won't, won't matter in the end, okay? So that's the difference between the temperature of the inlet stream and, and my reference temperature. I'm going to multiply that difference times heat capacity, and I'm going to multiply that times the mass flow rate. Not mass, but mass flow rate. So instead of getting energy, I'll get energy per time. Okay? So that's like, I don't know what units you like. Like if you like SI units, then this would be my point, joules per second. If you liked um, English units, BTUs per hour, something like that. So there's the enthalpy of the inlet stream. This is the enthalpy of the outlet stream, right? That's the outlet temperature. So subtract off the reference. There's heat capacity assumed to be.